All right, continuing UEFI development, I wrote down the remaining things I wish to do, sort of a, a to-do list here, if you will. I got a lot of printing stuff that I want to take care of first, so not really relevant to boot variables and such, so you may want to skip ahead or to the next video, depending on how long this takes, but I'm going to fix up printing a little bit for printf and other other things, then I'll, I'll get to changing the boot variables. I'll probably just print everything to the screen as like another menu option using the runtime services functions for getting the next variable name and getting and setting specific variables for boot variables such as boot order or boot next. I'll try to be doing that after that. I'll have something to write to another disk that is found on the system, probably just block IO protocols for the logical partition flag being false or the partition number being zero, which should correspond to like the entire drive, the entire disk. So I can use read and write blocks to read from the disk image disk to whatever disk that the user chooses, we'll say. Just the complete disk, not a partition on there to be simpler for now. And then you should be able to reboot and boot from that. So after that reboot is confirmed working on my laptop, on hardware, and I'll just have something to write. I'll have just something to write like an install file to the boot system and I'll check if that exists before loading the menu. And if it does exist, I'll just go directly to the load kernel function. So that's that's my plan. And I had all this working in testing, so this is kind of like a rewrite, maybe a little bit better than how I did it in testing. So uh, I'll get to this stuff first. So what did I want to do? Change printing on the main menu. I'll start doing development and get right to it. So I have up and down arrow keys functioning, right? But if I do up at the top, it doesn't move. I do down at the bottom, it doesn't move. I kind of just want to wrap that around so it's a little better because if I have, you know, five plus more menu options or whatever, it'd be easier to just go up and go to there instead of having to hold down the entire time. So I should be able to do that fairly simply. I don't think I have other things other than like a kernel file in here it says it's modified. See, so yeah, I don't have any new stuff since last time. So I'll get on that. And that's pretty simple where I'm loading the menu down here. Yeah, the up arrow and the down arrow. I can just change to, instead of preventing you from moving, in this case, I'm just going to move that to where I'm actually changing the row. So current row goes minus minus, so we go up on the screen from the Y value. Um, if we're above the minimum row, I'll just say we'll go above by one. If we're on the minimum row, else we'll just go to the whatever the bottom of the menu is. I'll do that. So the bottom of the menu would be, I think, max. Yeah, the max row here. Minimum row would be the top of the screen, which is zero. So if we have room to go, we'll go up by one. If we're already at the top of the screen, I want to wrap around to the bottom. So bottom of screen, I'll just say as needed. And this will just be go up one row. Otherwise, I'll set that to the max row. We'll just do that. So we already de-highlighted, and then we'll highlight the one that we're on and reset. And that should work similarly to how it did before. I'll just put that there, I guess. But that'll be for the up arrow specifically, and not the down. So we'll just see if that works. So I'm at the top. If I go down, I can go back up. If I'm at the top and press up, it just keeps going in a loop. So there we go. So I can see if that works for, say, the config tables. Yeah, all the menu options would still work. So calculations are good. So I'll just do the same thing here. So I'll just say go down one row. Else we'll set it to the minimum, which by default is zero. Wrap around to top of menu. This will be, get rid of that. Instead of bottom of screen, I'll say bottom of menu. Okay, so the, the down arrow is similar. We just go to the minimum, the minimum row instead of the max. And if we have room before the bottom, we'll just go down. So we'll wrap around that way. So I should be able to go up repeatedly. I should be able to go down at the bottom. It goes back to the top. And you know, it works same as it did before. So that's good. So I did that. 
Okay, so error in other printing. I put down, set the C error, remove the E printf. Yes, okay, yeah, I can do that. So currently when I'm printing like error codes and things, I'm doing an E printf function, which is the same as printf, it just prints to standard error or C error instead of standard out. And that's a lot of duplication I don't really need for E printf and E print number. Right, I don't really need those, I don't really want those, so I want to get rid of those and save some stuff, but uh, I, I could try to set like a static variable within printf that changes the C error or C out or whatever, or I mean setting a global thing is fine, I'll just say print or printf C out, we'll just say, and by default that'll be regular C out. So I'll just say printf specific um, C out or C error. We'll just say, and printfc out I'll have to make is another global thing. I'll put it below here. We'll have, yeah, simple text output protocol. Same as the others. So it'll be printf specific, c out or c error. That way I don't need to have duplicated functions here, so the error function where I print error stuff from, instead of eprintf, I'll do regular printf, but I'm going to set that c out equal to c error. So printf will print to standard error. And then we can reset that after, which is fine, after I call printf. I'll just do it before I end. I'll say reset to print to standard out. Okay, and then within printf, which I need the original stuff, not eprintf, but the regular one. Yeah, the regular printf, I will just print to, instead of c out, I'll print to the printf c out. And then we can change that now. I could have done a substitution, but I don't know. I'll just see. It's not in that many places right now. So that'll be C out until it's changed by the error function specifically, which will change it to C error, which right now is set to C out unless you have a serial um, a serial output, because that's what I change here, because I wouldn't get it to print because I don't have a serial output in QEMU or, or on hardware. But normally I think that's set to a serial output. So I just set it there. But semantically, I'm changing it to print to error instead of... Um, regular output, so that's fine. But with that, I don't need, I don't need eprintf, so I'm gonna get rid of that. No, I thought a percent sign usually went to the opposite of that. That's interesting. I guess not, cool. Oh, I got rid of some other stuff, that's what, that's why it didn't work. <laughs> Okay, anyway, I'll get rid of eprintf. Had a weird thing where I got rid of that. And print number's fine. I'll get rid of eprint number as well. Okay. So the places that I'm calling that, I don't want to call it anymore. And I want to change where I'm printing to see out within printf as well. But so what am I doing? In printf, I'm calling eprint number. That's weird. Yeah, so that was a bug anyway. That should not have been happening. Which is interesting, but yeah, everything should still print normally. If I have an error, that should still print normally, so I can check by making an error sort of before anything goes on. I'll just put it here before the menu is loaded. So error test. And we'll just do that. 42, secret to life, the universe, and everything. And then I'll get a key so that that stays on the screen. Okay, error test. We have a bad number. 42 didn't work, but I'm going to fix that in the future as well. But just error test is there. So I know error printing at a baseline works, although that number was wildly incorrect. But that's part of other 
changes I want to make regardless. Um, so, okay. So in print number where I'm printing, I want to change to printf as well. Because that'll print to C out or C error when it's called from the printf function. And by default, it'll be C out. But I think that's the only other thing I wanted to change, or I guess this. Well, that prints to error specifically. That's okay. Uh, okay. So that does the global. I'll make a V print F as well. That's the status as the first part. Do that. Print F, I can change the V print F. I'm going to do that first. So if I want to be able to call this sort of a better way or a different way from the error function with variable args, right, C has a way to do that called V print F, where you pass it a VA list specifically. So I can do that, and I can implement V print F as the current print F, and the current print F can call V print F. And it'll look similarly to this error function, but it'll pass its own things. So what I can do is rename printf to vprintf, and we'll just have it take in. Let me make a, a printf stub for that. But the current printf can be a, a vector or a, a variable argument rather, printf, and it can take in a VA list of args using a VA list for arguments. That way we can get the benefits of being able to use a VA list and not depending on where we want to call and how we want to use things here. So instead of taking our VA list args, we'll just take that from an argument on the stack, as it were, or in a register. It's not x86, 32-bit. And then we can still call start on that, given the format, probably. Or actually, we don't need to do that because we'll give a format that we run through anyway here, and then args will be able to take from the stack regardless with VA arg. So that'll still work the same. So it's a pretty easy change there. And then for the regular printf, we can have a VA list here. We can do VA start given format and call it args, and then we can call vprintf given format and args as a VA list, and then we can just end it at the end. So it'll call vprintf the same, but this way we can call a regular printf function with a variable number of arguments, or we can directly call vprintf if we want with the VA list. So it gives more functionality there. My reason for my reasoning for doing this was to use the error function a little bit differently. Built-in VA start does not use format. Okay, does it just use args? Probably not. I don't remember how to use VA start. <laughs> VA list AP and last. Okay, so last goes after. I would do that. Non void function. Is that 265 here? Oh, because it's bool. Yeah, I'll just return true. I'll just set a result here. So result can be equal to vprintf, that'll be all right. And all printing should still work the same. You know, I'm just calling vprintf instead. Uh, okay, but the error function that I wanted to change, which will be changed in a fair, a fair few places, I'm gonna pass the status first and I'm going to print out sort of the status as well as a, a string representation of that and then call printf with the result. Because right now I don't like that I'm calling error with like the text error. That's kind of, you know, extraneous. I can just move this into the error function and then just print out the text as like a printf or vprintf formatted string with extra arguments for that. I don't have to pass status as the end. I can pass it as like the initial thing and then not print that, just print this. Or if I don't have a stats, I can just print zero or something like that would be fine. So that's probably what I'm going to do. I'll get a bunch of errors and have to change in a lot of places, but that's what I wanted to do. So I'll do that. And this still changes printfc out and it calls vprintf. That's okay.
Okay, so given given a status, let's say I want to also print like where an error occurred, which would make this a little bit better. So what I can do also is pass in the file and line number at a minimum, which are guaranteed to be, well, the, the C specification says the macros double underscore file, double underscore, and line are defined to be a character pointer for a string null terminated, as well as an int for the line number. And then there's also not a macro, but there's also a string that's available in every sort of function. That is double underscore lowercase func, double underscore. And what this does is act as an equivalent in each function for there being, I don't think it's static. It might be static, but I know it's like a const character array it's something like this equals, you know, this will be name of function with underscores because they can't have multi-word names. So it'll be something like that. But what I can do is pass these values into, say, the error function. If we have an error, I can do it via macro to make sure I don't have to always do that. But we can just have extra info that we print out for an error in this case. It'll be a little bit better. And it is a constant, so I'll have to put a const there for func, otherwise it'll be invalid. But I'll just print out that stuff first. So let's do that. Let's just do printf. And I can print out file. We'll have an error. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll have an error, we'll have file, file name here. We'll have line, line number as an int, and we'll have, I guess it doesn't have to be in all caps, but that's fine. <laughs> I'll have the function as well. We'll put that on its own line. Uh, yeah, I'll just make sure it's on its own line. That'll be file, line, and func. And we'll print an error code and string afterwards. But to be able to do that and not have to pass these values in every time we call this error function, I can make a macro after this is defined and just say we define error with whatever as calling error with file, line, and func, along with whatever, which in this case, if you substitute the value here, um, it's going to be va args. So double underscore va underscore args, double underscore. And that just ensures that after this point, every time we call this function, we're actually calling it with these three things filled out with these predefined macros for file and line number and the predefined string for a function given the name of the function. And then whatever else, like the status and stuff, will be passed by this VA args being there. And everything else is going to give errors and stuff, but that's great. Okay, if I type specifier missing, that's true. Yeah, for status here, that'll be... Probably you went in, that's how I define that. So it'll be EFI status, rather. We have, an, uh, we have our own type for that. Okay, and then it's unused and all the other stuff. All right, so that's part one. All right, part two will be printing the error code in the string. So let's say if status, now let's say it's greater than zero, we can pass zero or success to not print this out but I'll have to pass it regardless because we don't have optional parameters in C. So if we have a status and let's say it's an error, so status minus the top bit, less than or equal to, I'll define like a max error count or something. Let's say max EFI error. Then we'll print it, that stuff out. And instead of this, we'll print out the status. So I'll say maybe error code and string, or I'll just print status. Yeah, that'll be all right. Print that as an X here. And then we'll have a string that defines just the human readable name for that. So that'll be status and let's say an EFI.h. I add a compile time array for the error codes, the status codes, like I have these ones here. So I know we're given the top bit set in a 64-bit number. So if I'm given eight, a bunch of zeros, and a three, I know I have EFI unsupported. So if I call this error function with that status code, 
I can subtract the top bit, which will just be three, get back the three, and we'll say we have a max error of whatever the number is in, in the documentation, in the spec. It's under D, status codes. And the maximum error where the top bit is set is 35 for HTTP error. So I'll set it to 35, which is fine. So max, move that up a little bit. So max EFI error set to 35 or even 36. So I can say if we reach this point, it's not good. We'll just say it's less than that. Might be a little bit better. But okay, I'll have um I'll have strings for these things. So let's say constant constant character pointer. What did I call it? I didn't call it anything. So let's say EFI error strings. That's self-explanatory probably. I'll have an array of strings here. And I'll set we can set specific indexes. So I'll just set the ones we have thus far, that'll be fine. And everything that isn't set will be, I think, null by default with this. So the number of these we'll have will be max EFI error. So we can reference that as 0 to 35, although 0 won't be anything. And 35 would be that max HTTP error right now in the spec. So 3 will be EFI unsupported. I'll make these char 16s so that we can use our print functions with them. I'll just say EFI unsupported. And right now I only have these three. I'll add more later probably, if I remember, which I won't. So never mind. <laughs> but this is just an example. The other ones would be null, right? We wouldn't have a string. It would just have a, a null in this case. But we'd still have the status code. But that way I can say we print the status and we print EFI error strings given the status minus the top bit. So if it's eight and a bunch of three, well, eight, a bunch of zeros and a three, we'll subtract the eight on the top, we'll get a three, that'll be reference into here and gives unsupported. That should be okay. This would be indexed by that number. And that should print the status. I'll say if applicable. Okay, then we'll print out the rest of the stuff, then we'll get a key before going on. All right, so then, yeah, everywhere I use error is going to be in error. So I'm going to go ahead and fix those. It's going to be a while, it might take like 10 or so minutes, so I'm going to skip past this stuff. But all I'm going to be doing here is where it ends with status, that would now be the first parameter. And I don't need to print the error here because I'm printing that you know, as part of this error text, I'm now printing that and I'm printing the status code. Um, I'll add a new line for that. So I'm also printing the status code here in a string, so I don't need to have that in the actual places where I'm calling the function. So I'm not going to do that. And I don't know why it's giving me Okay, now the syntax highlighting fixed itself, yeah. <laughs> so I'm changing where I call it with status at the end. I'm going to add status as the first parm here and just get rid of this error text. And then if there's nothing else, we can just end, you know, like that. Um, in the cases where I'm not giving a status code here, this one I probably should, but in some cases I don't give a status code. I don't know where. Like for... Yeah, if I'm just not locating the GOP, or if I can't locate the, the buffer, if I don't want to give a status for some reason, I'll just pass like a zero as the first thing. Yeah, like here, I don't have a status code to give this error. So in this case, I'll just send a zero so it won't print out that error status because it's above zero. Um, for it to print, it has to be above zero. So if I just pass a zero here, I'll just get rid of error and it'll say, could not find valid mode. So that's all I'm going to do here. So I'm going to change everywhere where I'm calling error and I'll be back when I do that because it'll be some uh, some boring stuff but the errors will look a little bit better so that'll be good so yeah see you in a second all right I finished converting all of the errors and it compiles and runs all right so just to show the new sort of error format I'm gonna put a little little debug error print before the menu here 
And we'll try that out. So error, I'll send in EFI invalid or device unsupported or something. I don't remember what it was called, device error, yeah. I'll just send an EI, EFI device error and we'll say, it'll say error, you know, this code, it'll say file line function, we'll say device error test. And I'll just do that. Then we'll get a key. So what does that look like? If I error file equals a bunch of random garbage, it gives function. It gives the status line, device error, device error test. Those two look all right. The first line does not, which is not good. Passes in a bunch of uh, garbage. Let's see if I can make that uh, larger. Yeah, what is all this garbage that's happening? I don't know, but the status line prints all right for the code and the string for it, and then the string that you pass in. The line is correct. Function is not. File is not. Okay. But those things are incorrect because I'm printing, I didn't mean to hold down the D key there, because I'm printing character strings in place of char 16s. That's why the text is garbled, but this does work here. Yeah, see file and function are just ASCII, or UTF-8 with ASCII range. They're not char 16s, but that's another thing that I want to fix for printing. So that's okay. Uh, okay, so I'm printing this stuff. Yes, I'm just passing them for file line and function. I did take those out of the other calls. I did change to vprintf. Okay, global rows and columns I'll do, but also do this stuff. Okay, so let's do some printf changes and make things a little bit better before I do the other stuff. Or vprintf in this case. Am I calling vprintf from error? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So I want to make this follow more of the actual C standard way of doing things, <laughs> of printing formatted strings. If I say, you know, the main page for it, which explains the formats and all, and this comes basically from the C specification for C11 or 17 or what have you, C99. Um, in, in other words, it's sort of restated, but this pretty much follows one to one. So what we have is we have we have flags, we have a a field width, which is going to be a minimum field width. Then we have a precision, which is going to be a maximum field width for digits or maximum number of characters to print for a string. And we have length modifiers, which says if we're printing a, a uint8 effectively or an int8 or a short, which would be signed or unsigned, so a 16-bit number, L would be a regular, probably 32-bit number, LL can be 64-bit in Unix land, and then synonyms and other things for pointers or for sizes, size T and other, and other stuff. So I'm going to try to follow that a little bit more closely here where I'm printing each formatted string value. I'm going to have some other things here. We'll say we have an alternate form, which is going to be like if you put that, that octothorpe before an x, if you want to print 0x, for example. So I'm going to start that off as false, and then I'll have flags for the other things. Let's say we have a length in bits, or a width in bits. We'll say, and I'll just make that uint in, it's fine. I'll start that at 0, but this will really only be 8, 16, 32, or 64. Although if you want to print for other stuff, you can do, you know, 128 or other things for double values or floats and such, but I'm just going to limit it to these right now, these four things, but it'll be the length in bits, like a, a character will be 8 bits, a short would be 16, etc. And we'll get that from the length modifiers. Um, and I should add other stuff too, but I'll add it in a second. If I want to deduplicate, well I'm not doing it here really, so I'm calling print number repeatedly for different cases. That stuff is probably okay. I might change how I'm calling print number. I'm not sure yet, but I can take this stuff out if I do the alternate form, so that'll be one thing I change. Um, let's start with these two and I'll add more as we go. So I'll check for flags, and I'll just say, well, right now I'm only going to check for the alternate form, so that's fine. So this is going to be a char 16, yeah, a char 16 pointer. 
So I need the U for literals. So we'll say if it's a, a U for the pound sign or the octothorpe here, the hashtag, and we'll say that's an alternate form. So that'll be true and we'll do I++, right? And then you'd wanna check for other flags like the zero or the, the minus to left justify. you know, or other, other flags. Um, but after that, we have the, the minimum field width. So I'll say, this would be eg 8.2, this would be eight. And then we'll check for the precision. This would be two. I'm gonna say maximum field width in some cases. And then after I would check for the length modifiers. Uh, let's just say H, yeah, H, 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 L, L, L. And then I'll go on to the next argument here. This will be check for I think they called it a conversion specifier. So we'll do that. Okay, so minimum field width, this would be like an is digit function, which I don't think I have. We could check if we have a number for that. I have is digit for ASCII. All right, let's make a 16-bit version of that. Char 16 is digit, I'll just say is digit C16. Instead of 15, and this will be if C is in between, yeah, the U, the U prefixed 0 and 9, easy enough, because that's char 16. So if is digit C16 of format I, after we skipped an optional flag there, then I want to get the full number that is there for the, the minimum width. I guess I'll set that here, or say minimum field width, or this would be, well, that's what they called it actually. All right, I'll have that and I'll have precision. And then width and bits would be for the length, really. Maybe I'll call it length bits. I don't know, that's fine. Okay, so if it is there, we can do a while, or I could just have it be a while. probably be better there. So this would be the minimum field width if I want to get a number, then while we have a digit here, and it starts at zero every time, so that's all right, the minimum field width would be equal to itself multiplied by 10. And we'd add on the next number there, so that'd be the current format i, and it'd be minus u zero. This is not for hex digits. This is only for integer digits, so I probably could check for hex digits here, but oh well. I'm assuming you're inputting integer digits for this. But it would be itself times 10, and then you add in the next thing. So base 10 integer digits there, like that. And we can just add in I++, because the next time it'll check, that'll increment. If the next one is a digit, we'll add to the current number. Else I++, if it's not a number, it'll go on here. So that'll be all right. That should be... Hopefully good, easy enough. So the precision would be a dot and then a number. And the spec, the C spec says for these formatted strings that has to come after this, which would come after the flags. So all this being in order makes it a little bit easier. So we'll just say if this equals the dot, then we'll do this and we'll say while it is a number, then we'll add it to the precision field instead, which starts at zero. Yep, there we go. That's easy enough. I could also make an abstracted function that's like get number, which would do this and just return a number, but I don't know. Maybe it's a little easier doing it in line, makes more sense. It depends, but that's fine. So the length modifiers is pretty easy as well. If I say we have an H or an L, we can check for those 
I'll just do it with else's. And we can check if we have a single one or another one. So I'll skip past the first H and I'll set the length and bits to 16 for a short. And then if the next one is also an H, and you could probably do this a little bit better, but if the next one is also an H, then I'll just increment again and set the length and bits to 8, because HH would be a, a signed or unsigned character, or 8 bits. A single H would be a signed or unsigned short, which would be 16 bits. Uh, for an L, it should just be 32 bits, but I'll set that explicitly here. And I'll do this, make a little bit more sense maybe. Thirty-two, not sixteen. Okay, and then we have to, if we have another L, which would just be sorry, these need to be singular. We have an initial H increment, and we have another H, it would be H H. An initial L increment, and we have another L, that'd be L L. And this would be sixty-four, we'll say for longs. Okay, so we're setting the length in bits that we want to print for a given number. We're getting the the maximum amount we want to print in digits or as a string. And we're setting the minimum we want to print as the, the minimum field width there. So to be able to change that, I'm going to set things a little bit differently where I'm printing. So printing a character here. If they pass in HHC, I want to print 8-bit or ASCII. That's a little bit different from how regular printf works, but we're, work we're working with char 16t values by default in EFI, so I'm making it a little bit different here. So let's say if they set a length in bits, if they use the length specifier and it's 8, so they did HHC, then I'm going to grab char string 0 is a char 16t, but in this case, I'm going to convert that to a regular character or to a UN8. Either one, it would be fine, but I can convert it to a regular char here. Uh, otherwise, I can say it's just a char 16, which is what I was doing before. But it says an int, but I'll just make sure it's that way anyway. Ask your other 8 bit char. Uh, I'll say 16 bits, assuming 16 bit char 16 T. Okay. And then that'll still set the same, the first value there in a null, and we'll print that out. That should still work. Hopefully, this would work. I think it would. Okay. It just would be one byte instead of two. But we'll see. We'll try that out. For an S, a string would be similarly. We'll try that. This is grabbing a char 16T. Assuming 16-bit char 16T. So for a string, and for a normal one, I'll have to change this a little bit because this would just be a character, and we'd have to use this. Uh, let's be HHS, let's do that. HHC. Eight bit ASCII chars. Okay. So if we have a a minimum field width, I guess would be the minimum for a string. Or would it be different? Not doing zero padding or anything. So the minimum width, does this work for strings or not? Your characters would be more. Oh, it would be padded with blanks or not. Okay, so it probably would work with that. 
And I have the braces here, so I can do another thing. Um, I could have a count. Let's say with printed number of, let's say digits, chars, printed. I'll probably have these be multi-line things. So I'm trying to think how I want to do this. Let's say we have, well, a nested thing here. We'll have J be less than, if we have a maximum, we could just say while string. So I do this like I had up here where I'm just taking into the first thing of this two byte string that I can print with, with C out. So that'd be the data it's string, we'll do plus plus, we'll print that out. And I'll say with printed or digits, what do I call it? <laughs> with printed, which is that, that sounds kind of dumb, doesn't it? Maybe num printed. I'll just say this, and num printed is less than the max. Well, if the max is zero, that would go off immediately. So I'm trying to think how to make this work with a maximum and a minimum number, number of digits for precision. I guess while it's less than the precision, we'd want to keep printing. I'll just do this. If it equals precision, then we'll break. That's fair. So I could do that. Because if it's if it's zero, it's fine. I mean, well, zero would equal. So I probably don't want to do that. <laughs> if it's a null, it's not going to matter. I'll do that, so, okay. Is that way I'll have to add at least one there? Yeah. Or do a do while loop, I don't wanna do that right now. So if we're given like a string and we have 0.4, you know, HHS, that would be what this one is for. We wanna print, I wanna print four characters from this ASCII string. So while we have a string, I'll get the first character, increment it, print out the character, if we reach the precision break, else we'll go again, up to four, unless it ends early. So I'll do that. Okay, then I'll say while num printed is less than the minimum field width, then I'll print out spaces by default to pad out the string, which I think is reasonable. I could probably do these with four loops a little better, but this is what I'm gonna do right now. So say stop printing at max characters. And this one I'll say pad out with blanks by default. I should change that to zero or whatever if I need to, but blanks by default to minimum field width. Okay. And then I'll do a similar thing for char 16t here. Maybe there's a better way to do this without duplicating things, but I figure if I have a character pointer versus a char 16, I know that's kind of life. So it's not that much duplicated logic, but it is a little bit. Because I don't think I can have this go through in one loop if I'm given two different types for the stream and two different declarations. Although I guess I can make it a void pointer and change it and then do this, but I feel like that would end up being messy later and cause bugs. So not gonna do that. Charge 16T should work the same. Okay. So for digits and stuff, I'm just printing a number, a base, and if it's signed or not, I need to print out sort of the minimum or maximum as well. So I could pass those both the print number. I could at least pass in 
probably the precision. That would be the max, right? So what does precision say? If precision is given as a dot, it is taken to be zero. Negative precision is if it was omitted. This gives the minimum number to appear for these. Okay, so integers will be the minimum number of digits. Field width is a little different. Oh, and if it's a star, I have to get them from the stack. I forgot about that. Okay, I'll, I'll do that in a second. Um, the precision and the, the minimum field widths can be stars. This is be this is while is digits. Let's try that. If format i is an asterisk, then we want to get it from the next argument. Get int argument for minimum field width. Or we could have the dollar and the M. I'm not doing that right now. I'll just, this is a little easier. We can take it from an int literal that's passed in or just a, a variable or whatever values there. So that would be VA arg, which is fine. So that would be VA arg given args. Yeah, and then the value, which would be an int. Else get number, I guess literal. Yeah. From format string. Okay. The precision as well, it could be a dot and an asterisk or not, so I would check that here. Int argument for precision. There we go. And I would skip over that as well. <laughs> okay. And these are also skipping over by iterating I. All right, okay. So for numbers, I can pass in the minimum amount of digits, but not the max. I could pass in the max as well. I just don't know if numbers apply for that normally, because it didn't say. It just says with fewer characters. Like, do we do that for numbers, like integers as well? That sounds kind of dumb. I don't know, I might just do the minimum number of digits here for ints, because it doesn't specify for the minimum field width. And precision gives the minimum number there, so I'm not going to worry about it there, but I will pass in the precision for the minimum amount of digits to print here. Which I keep doing that, sorry. Which I think is padded with zeros. The number after the radix character for the other one, significant, or printed from a string. I guess that would depend on the padding, but if it says digits, I figure that would be zeros, right? I mean, this gives it for zero padding. If a precision is given with an integer conversion, zero is ignored. Okay, so I'm assuming it just prints zeros out, so that's what I'm going to do if the digits are less than the precision in this print number function, but I'll pass these things to print number, but I will have to change these depending on how big the length in bits is, but let me do this first, or I can do it later. Not, I don't have a base, so let me do that. Let me do base. Like here I'm passing in 10 for the base, so I'm going to make this a little more dynamic. And we'll have a sign value as well.
And if I want to print a number, I'll just say sign. Signed num, okay. <laughs> if I want to print a number, I'm going to say numeric as a Boolean. And I'm going to use these values for printing numbers here specifically. And then I'm going to sort of combine logic down here after I'm printing all these, if we're printing a number or, or not. So for an int32, I'm going to say numeric is true. Base is 10. And signed num is true because it's an int for a, a D value there. And I'm going to pass these things in for these. This will be signed as false for a hexadecimal number treated as an unsigned integer, but change the base to 16. For an unsigned integer, the base will be 10, but it is numeric and it is not signed. And for a Boolean, it's gonna be unsigned, but the base is gonna be two. For an octal, I'm treating it as unsigned, but the base is eight. So the only thing that is signed is integers here. Okay, and then I'll break from all this. That's the default. So it'd be for this switch. Okay, then I'll say if numeric. So if we're printing a number. I'll call print number, which has number base signed, and I'll add in the precision. So I'll say minimum digits for that. And I have to get the number first, so I'll do that. <laughs> so I'll switch on the length and bits. Is that what I called it? Yep. Cool. And this is within its own scope, so I can have local variables here. So I'm going to have a uint in or a 64. I have a 64, because length can go up to 64. And I'll just do number. Which I didn't say anything else for a number up here, did I? No, okay. Go back to where I was. Okay, so we have a case of 8 or 0 or 32 or the default. If I don't specify anything, I'm going to have all those be the same thing here. Not 8, sorry. <laughs> 0 or 32 or default, because I'll have just an L will be the normal int size, which is 4 bytes in Unix here. I'll have number be varg args, and we'll take in 32-bit number, I suppose. I think that's a, that seems all right. Or I can take in a number and convert it, like there, but I think this will be okay. Yeah, I'll do that. So if we have 8 bits specifically, like with HH, this work with comments? Eh, we'll find out. Then we'll grab 16 bytes from the stack. However, we'll, we would probably get a compiler warning that that's less than an int. So I'll have to grab an int and then I can convert it to a 16-bit value. And if you're worrying about printing signed values, casting signed to unsigned or printing a signed as an unsigned will work or vice versa. So it's okay to just take the full 16 bits here as an unsigned value. But you could also check, you know, if it's signed then just take like an int 16. That would probably also work. I'm just trying to be simpler here if it still works. But we can, you can always make test cases and fix it if it's <laughs> if it's broken. Uh, 16 would be 16. This should be 8, not 16. This can be 16, but 16 bit is less than an int. So we have to take an int by default for VAR because that's how the macro and compiler defines it as. Um, an 8 bit, we can cast 8 bit. And 64-bit, we can take 64-bit. So we should just be able to take that directly. And then we can print the number after, along with the base and the boolean. I can make base 8-bit, that's fair. Made it a uint in. This could be uint eight for base. 
signed, I'll pass in. If it's signed num, yeah, because I'm calling that there, because signed is a keyword. And then the minimum number of digits is going to be the precision. Okay, so that'll print a number out. Reasonably, that might fix some other things in areas depending on taking actual space from the stack. Unused parm, case default, and min digits, that's true. We don't need to print these out unless they're alternate forms, which I didn't do that. Let me do that first. I always forget things. So if I'm given a binary number, percent %b, I'll set these values and I'll say if we have an alternate form, then I want to print out the stuff for that. So I'll print out the 0b as the prefix there, binary prefix. For octal, I'll print out the 0o for octal. And for hex, I will print out the 0x. I'm not printing out uppercase if the things are uppercase or not, because I think this looks worse than that. I think this is easier to read with the lowercase x. So I'm always going to print just the lowercase as the prefix. And we'll do that. And then I can take that out of this function and not worry about it. Decimal, I guess I can still do that if it's negative. And if I'm doing nothing for the default, I'll just change and say if base is 10 and we're negative, then I'll do that. Okay, so then I have, what am I passing in? Min digits here. So I'm gonna do that before the negative sign at the start of the number. It would be after this point. So it'd be buffer i plus plus. Okay, so I'll say while i is less than minimum digits. So if it's zero, it'll never be less than, and that's fine. I'll just add to the buffer here. And we'll add zeros, so pad with zeros, pad with zeros. It's not padding on the left or the right, you know, I'm not doing the left versus right justifying. You'd have to change things a little bit for that. But as far as passing a precision of like four for four digits, if we print a three digit number, it should pad it with a zero. Hopefully. But we'll try that. Okay, or we should pass in a zero to pad it out, but I'm not doing that for flags. Unexpected expression here because I have the call, the thing there, right? Oh, because I have case default. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So does it still print stuff like the ACPI numbers? It does. It doesn't print the 0x because, you know, I have that behind the alternate form now to fit more with how the C works. The C standard works. But I just want to check number printing and stuff is still okay. So if I wanted to change that, let's say for printing the ACPI headers, I can change this now. Like instead of printing four C's in a row, I should be able to just, yeah, take a pointer to the first thing here. And the header signature is in EFI Live or EFI here. ACPI table header, that's in EFI Live probably. These are just character pointers, character arrays. Okay, so I can print with my new precision, 0.4, and then for a length modifier, HH, signifying 8-bit characters here for this string, for my non-C standard way of doing it, and then four characters max. And then I don't need to pass in, you know, four different things here, just pass in the address of the first one. And let's say for these x values, I want to print the alternate form with the beginning 0x. So I'll do that. And I'll just see if that works for the signature for these tables, for the table headers. Invalid format specifier. Nice. Okay, never mind. <laughs> oh, it didn't like this. 
because I needed an S. That would be why. I should have it print better stuff for that, but I needed the S, the S for the strings. There we go. So the signature XSDT, that's now printing four characters. The other things have a zero X for the prefix. Just wanted to prove that printing works there. Okay. So OEMID, for example, this is six characters. So just an address for the first one. And I can do six HHS, so I don't need to null terminate a string. I can just do that. One, two, three, four, five. This is eight characters for the table ID. So point, point eight HHS. And then creator ID is point four for another four characters. And that just looks a little bit better. And the values still print out all right. Okay, so I, I would want to change, you know, other places where I'm printing numbers and everything, of course, but that's just as an example. Like these addresses, I'd want to print the form with the, the hash sign in front of the X, and then the signature I'd want to print. This is eight. And so on and so forth. So I'll, I can do that stuff later. One, two, three, four, five, six. Which I won't remember to, but I can say that I'll do it later. <laughs> this is OEM ID. And do that off camera. So I, I can do that. But uh, regardless, that fixes a fair bit of printing that I can change for stuff. Alternate form. I got the length things. I added the prefix there for the alternate form, deduplicate logic, I did that, and C printing, did that, okay. Get a number from a user, I haven't done that. Global text rows and columns instead of hard coding, that would probably be good. Okay, yeah, I can do that. So let's have a global variable up here, maybe below here, it's fine, I think they're 32 bits. But I don't remember. Simple text output, I believe it's mode. No. Just go to the protocols here. Simple text output mode. Okay, so the cursor row and column are int 32s. But if I'm getting the cursor position, I thought it was u int 32 like for query mode. Columns and rows are uint ends, so I can use uint end, that's probably all right. So I'll say text rows and text columns. And there's only two places I would need to set this to have them available globally. The first one is when I initially get stuff in the main function. I can test this stuff here too. Wherever I call, is it query? Yeah, query mode right here. So I'll just set global rows, columns, values there. Or I can do them both on one line, two lines, that's fine. Else I'd have to set them wherever I'm choosing the menu option for set text mode. So inside of there, where am I changing things? That's where I'm selecting. I guess where I do query mode. Yeah, if I selected one and I do query mode, then we'll get them. So I'll set them there. And this would be text modes, mode index, dot rows. And columns. Okay. And that way, I'd have these two values available globally, like where I'm setting things 
or i is above zero, like I'm doing hard coding here for pausing every 20 lines, wherever this is when I'm printing the memory map, instead of doing this, I can just check if the current cursor row, which is in C out, so if C out mode cursor row is, we'll say, greater than or equal to the text rows, the maximum amount of rows on the screen, say minus two, then we can print out, press any key to go on or something. Or to continue, you know. Because then I do a new line for the last line on the screen. So I'll just do that. So if we have at least two lines left, or only two lines left, we'll press a key. And that's a little bit better and a little bit more dynamic of a way to check when you're done printing. And that's when printing the memory map. So comparison of integers, int32 and u int n. Okay. I'll do int32 then, but it'll say the other one. No, I didn't get an error for the other ones. Okay. Int32. So printing the memory map, it prints at the bottom, press any key to continue, which is reasonable. I guess it doesn't erase it. So in this case, I need to erase the screen first because that'll be not good. <laughs> it's a case by case basis. Let's clear the screen when I do that. Do I have a clear screen function? I don't. Is it clear screen? I thought I had a, I do have a clear screen. See out clear screen. Okay. Yeah, this, in this case, we'll have to do that. In some cases I might want to do that or make an abstracted function to just take in a key and clear the screen for that case, but okay. So press any key, clears it, press any key. So it does this. It should be dynamic. If I choose a larger screen with 31 rows instead of 80, or I'm um, sorry, 31 rows instead of 25, we should print more than 21 at a time. Yeah, we print up to 27 here. And 56. So that is a little bit more of a dynamic way when the attributes look bad because I need to set the minimum width and stuff with the new printing. But that's a way to get a dynamic, you know, press any key at the bottom of the screen sort of thing. Just check where the cursor row is compared to the maximum amount that we're saving now globally. And two lines is decent because then it'll print this at the bottom and then go down by one. Or you can do this without a new line and just do minus one or something. I don't know. Anyway if it's zero based or not. Okay, so I'll have to fix up printing in several other areas, but that's that's one way of making printing a little bit better. And then the last thing, not printing related, would be sort of a utility function to get decimal or hex from the user, which would make getting a number easier, such as when I'm setting values for boot variables. So I guess I could try that. Before I do that, I want to see how this printing works, if I print a number out and it works all right. So let's say percent %d, which should be a 32-bit number, say 23. Does it print out garbage still? It does. Interesting. It doesn't give the right file. Oh, because I'm not doing that within the error case. Yeah, okay. Forgot, I had, to, I had to fix that. File here is going to be HHS, and function will be HHS, because I just changed printing to work for 8-bit values when I'm printing errors. Okay, now it looks better. <laughs> so it gives the file the line number and the right function name, status, and test 23 is now 23, not some garbage number. So it looks like that's working. So I am happy for that. Okay. Ugh. Let's make some utility functions here. Let's say get a get an integer, or I could even make a thing to for the base, depending on what base is passed in. Get a number in that base. I just say get a number from the user with get key. A 
maybe it'll be a bull. Well, it needs to return a number. Or I could pass in a number and return it. I'd need a way to check error conditions. Uh, we'll just say that. We'll pass in a pointer to the number. I'm assuming this is only unsigned numbers as well. Let's say an int, so they can be signed, I guess. I don't know. Okay, let's have a buffer here. We pass in the number to set, so I'll say until they hit enter, we'll get a key. So we'll say if I input key, key. We'll get a key. Maybe a do while I'll set and change in a minute. So it'd be key.unicode char not equal to the enter key, which would be R. Return, carriage return. So until they hit enter, we want to keep getting digits. I'll say if is digit bc16 in this case. Unicode character. And I want to add it to the number. I guess I can clear the number first. Or we'll say if not number, if it's a null pointer, then return, of course. Can't do anything there. Okay, else we'll clear it. And I'll get a number and add in 10 and then whatever the key dot char minus zero is. So if it's a digit, I have Unicode character minus zero, or really we'll do digits offset by that. If it's A to F, I want a minus A. So I guess it depends. Might not do this then. Because I'm not checking hex hex digits here. Yeah, is digit will be zero through nine, so that's fine. I'll have an else for the other case. Do this. So this is just get number. Let's do what I can do with the base. Hmm. Hmm. Let me do two different ones first. And if I can see similar logic, I'll combine them. I'll do two, two similar ones first here. So I'll get an int by multiplying by 10. We'll just do this. So we press enter, then we'll return and the number will be set. Otherwise, I'll do hexadecimal, which would be u int n, and it'll multiply by 16 in this case, else we'll have unicode chars in between a and f. It'll be subtracted from a. If it, else, if it's between uppercase A and F, it'll subtract from uppercase A. Hmm, would that work? That wouldn't work, would it? So 0 through 9 would be all right. This would be 0 to the 6 or whatever. I need to add 10, yeah. Okay, <laughs> because if we, have, if we pass in a B, it would be 1, but it would actually be 11. We have to add in 10. In this case, 0 through 9 is fine, but 10 to 15, we have to add in 10 to get 10 to 15. Uh, okay, this will be get hex. Doesn't like it. That's fair. 
So I need to do key dot Unicode chars less than or equal. Expected expression. I haven't made a semicolon there. It's true. And there. Unused result, 434. Because I don't need to do that. Okay, and we'll keep getting stuff until it's a zero. All right. Okay, and it still prints that. I'll, I'll use these things later, like when I'm setting the value for a boot variable, like boot current or boot next, it is four hexadecimal digits. So I should be able to call get hex and get a number. Maybe. I don't know. That'll get a number from a user. I actually don't know if I'm going to use these or not. We'll find out. But I wrote that down, so I wanted to do it for some reason. <laughs> right. I could print what the value is, and then the user would see what they're doing. Probably should do that. Because where I'm going to use it later, I would want to be able to see what's happening. I can actually just do this. I don't need the character string there. Okay. Eh, we'll just do this. So it'll it'll print as long as you're inputting a number. Should still take that in. Okay. So if I put it at the start. Say down here again, I'll have a debugging thing. We'll say get a hex number given, you know, hex num. And it'll just print that to the screen. So if I do make and control, there's nothing on here right now. And I'll do control F for full screen. If I do one, it'll print a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, E, F. But other ones like O and P won't work. Zero will. Enter will go on. So that's all I'm doing right there. For getting a number. Oh, yeah. That's all I'm doing for getting a number. So I did this. Okay. So let's add some stuff to print some variables finally. And I'll use those get number functions for setting the values. It's all global variables. All right, let's do that. So another thing here, I'll print under the print tables function. Let's say print global, well, EFI global variables, because we have our own global variables up here. I don't want to be too confusing. So we'll just do that and I'll have other ones later. Yeah, okay. We'll just grab this stuff, print another header. And I'll just print the EFI global vars here. And I'll be using the runtime stuff, <laughs> the runtime addresses. I guess I'll take the timer off while I'm in the menu, but leave a screen, do that. Yeah, I'll do the any key to go back just in case. Just to make sure that the menu option works. Print global variables down here. It works. Okay. So I am going to want to use the, the variable functions within the runtime services, so variable services here. I'll use get next variable name specifically for this menu option. Okay, yeah, I'll be using get next variable name from the runtime services. 
Uh, the specification looks a little bit different now. It looks better. There should be less typos and things because I had a um, a nice guy. Was I'm trying to remember the, the username. Sorry, <laughs> the elevator guy. Thank you for sending me like a little email with the the revision notes for Errata A for the UEFI spec release 2.10. This came out like a week ago since um, my recording date right now. It came out July 2024. And it has fixes, including typos and things. And the text, I think, is a little bit better and fixed in some areas. So that's nice. The latest, ver the latest version of the, the spec here. So get next variable name enumerates variables. Gives you the ultimate size if you want it. Gives you the name. Not the ultimate size, sorry. The ultimate size of the name, rather. The name of a string to print, and then the string itself is in that string buffer. And it gives you a GUID for that. So we need to call this, uh, if buffer is too small, I'll allocate a larger buffer, but we need to call this initially with a null terminated string and variable name to start the search. We need to actually have a valid buffer that points to a null character, which will ignore the GUID input parm. Cannot be used as a filter. You have to retrieve everything and filter on your own, which is lame, but that's all right. Don't use set variable between calls to this because that'll reset or change them. If the buffer is not null terminated, it'll send invalid parameter. If they don't exist, then we get invalid. Okay, so we have to send in the current name and, and GUID of something that was just sent to get the next one in the list. So if we get a valid name, we call it again with that name and we get the next name, essentially. And we need to, you know, have a buffer large enough to hold that name. So some of these values are from a different area in the spec in chapter three in the boot manager, specifically for load options. The variables are, I don't remember, are they under here? <laughs> the driver model, I think they're under here somewhere. I don't remember where they are, dang it. Globally defined variables, yeah, I can't read. So 3.3. Globally defined variables. So, so these are what I'm going to print out, essentially. There's stuff There's stuff on hardware that won't be in this list, of course, for your specific device or firmware vendor. Um, but the ones I'm going to be you know, worried about in this video or the next one is going to be the boot variables specifically. So we'll have boot options, which will start with boot and then four hexadecimal digits, 0000, zero, zero, zero through FFFF, which give a number of options to boot from. Boot current is the current one of these boot options that was booted from that you're currently running. Boot next would be a one-time set for the next boot, which QEMU OVMF I found did not work for this, or it doesn't have it, but hardware I think should work for that. Boot order is a list of UNT16 values of these boot options. So boot order would have like 0001, 000A, 0009, and in that order, one, then 10, then nine, would be these boot options that are used when the computer initially starts up. Automatically, it'll go and try the first boot load option in that list. So boot 0001, in this case, would be the one that's loaded first from the boot order variable. And then there's different types of support options as well. And you have all these other things, you know, keys for specific things. <laughs> I still like, I still like these. And then some, uh, I didn't mean to zoom out, and some other stuff, vendor keys, other stuff for secure boot, platform recovery, other, other fancy things. So I will need this global variable vendor GUID because that's used and will be printed for finding, you know, GUIDs for boot variables. If you want to set and add a new boot option with set variable, you need to use this as the vendor GUID, or it would be, I think, good if it was used as the vendor GUID. So that's what I'm going to do. So let me add things into the GUID values. I'll put it, I guess, above the config table. I'll just put it there. Global variable. So this is for EFI global variables. And then I'll have to go and get stuff for get next variable name. So let me do that back where I was. This is in section 822. Let's move that over. It's a little bit too large. There we go. I don't have 8.2. I don't know. Well, it's wherever my runtime services are. Here. So I've set virtual address maps. So I'll put it under there. And 
I'll do if I get next variable name, which is not what they called it, but that's what I should define it as here. So it works with my naming like everywhere else. So I'll put it under set virtual address map. Get next variable name. So this will say it's going to look different because I've read A, but that's fine. It should correspond to the same section as 2.10, but I'll just put that to be specific. Okay, 2.2. Two. Um, and then, yeah, I can copy paste if I want. That's true. Still doesn't copy over line endings, but that's fine. So to copy the other ones, because though it's returning EFI status, it'll still be EFI API. Pointer, uh, get next variable name. Essentially, that's what it's going to be. So even though it looks different, that's what you can define it as, and that'll that'll work. So get next variable name will be defined as get next variable name, but it'll still be a function pointer here from runtime services. So okay, I had b1. So I need to call it with these things, size of the buffer and everywhere else. Didn't have any other things there, no. Okay, so let's do that. We'll have variable name size, I'll set to zero. I'll have char 16 variable name as a buffer. You can call it a buffer, that's fine. And EFI GUID, vendor GUID, can be ignored, it'll be whatever, so that's fine. Okay, so I'll do that. So we'll call rs get, get next variable name. And I'll have to supply these things, var name size. Right now it's zero, but the first one with a null will give me probably buffer too small. I should pass it with a null though. So I can have an initial size, give it a small buffer, and then call it in a loop and enlarge the buffer dynamically. That would probably be better. So let's say var name size right now is two. Two will be two for two null bytes for a char 16 single null character that the buffer will point to. So I'll allocate a pool for this. And I'll have a status. So allocate loader data. This will be var name size. And the buffer will be var name buffer. Is allocate pool needs a double pointer. Oh, buffer is a void pointer and that gives an address. So yeah, double, avoid double pointer. Okay. So this will be fine. And we'll just check in case we can't allocate two bytes. That would be very sad. Try my new error function here. Could not allocate two bytes. That would be bad. And we'll just return status. Okay, but if we could, then we'll go through here. So we'll give the size, we'll give the buffer variable name, which is in and out. So I'm assuming I can just pass this because it'll use that and set the values at that point in that buffer. And GUID would be the address for that as well. And we'll set the status to that. So we'll say if status equals EFI buffer too small, which I don't remember if I have that Defined, I do, okay. It's defined as five. 
we'll have to enlarge the buffer here. How do I know when it's done? Values are not a name of an existing one, invalid is returned. When the entire list has been returned, the error EFI not found is returned. Okay. So I would say while status not equal EFI not found, I suppose. If it's too small, then we'll do this and continue. But we'll have to reallocate for a larger buffer. Otherwise, these things are bad, but that's fine. On the first time, the input values are not a name of an existing one. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to print, print name. I'll also, after I print, we'll pause at bottom of screen. So if it's greater than or equal to text rows, say minus two. Say, press any key to continue. Get a key and clear the screen. Then we'll get the next name and we'll do that. Okay. So if we, if we got buffer too small, we'll have to reallocate a larger buffer. So I'll call free pool. which I probably should check the status, but I'll call free pool for the variable name buffer, which is a pointer. It takes a void pointer that can be implicitly casted. That's fine. And then we'll get another one for the size that should be contained within the variable name size if the status was buffer too small. So we'll just do this again. So you could not allocate memory for next variable name. Okay, let's say percent %u. Give a good error message here. Okay, else we'll allocate, so we did allocate that. But I need the values from the old one. So let's get a larger buffer. I need like a temp buff. Well, this one's okay. Yeah, I need a temp buffer. Um, let's do this. Let's say temp buff. Yeah, temporary buffer will set the values in there, or copy, really. Do a mem copy, yeah. So I'll mem copy into the temporary buffer the values from the original buffer. I have string copy, I wonder. I do have string copy, it sets this for U16. I do, okay, let's do that and a temp buffer from the original variable name buffer. Size would be, well, the original variable name size. Which should be before this point. So let's put it here. So I can't do that. Uh, I'll do it here. If it's too small, we'll have the old size that'll probably get allocate a new one, string copy into there, the old size. Copy old buffer to new buffer 
free the old buffer, set new buffer. Okay, then we need to set the new size. And what else? So we allocate a new buffer, copy into there, delete the old one, set it to the new one, set the new size of the new one that we'll need, and we get the next name. And if it's still too small, we'll reallocate for the new one using the new size. Yeah. And then we'll pass that in for the buffer in that. Okay, that should be all right. If we get a name and we're good, I want to print it out, which I think should be char 16, so that'll work. You can print out the GUID if you want. So I'm not going to. I'll probably just print out the name, one per line. And we'll see how that works. Pause at the bottom of the screen. Get the next one while it's not found. OK. Hopefully that's all right. So I need to set a null byte into here before I call the first one. Set variable name to point to initial single null byte. So I put it in there. Yeah, so I'll just set the value there, which is going to be a char 16. Because then this will start the list. Start off call to get list of variable names. Okay, and then I'll have to free the buffer when I'm done. It should be variable name buff. Okay, because we'll only have one buffer active at a time after this is called. We'll need to free that. That should be okay. Okay. Let's print these on the side, take up a little bit less room. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Undeclared identifier, if I not found. Oh, I don't have that. All right. So what is not found? That'd be at the bottom inside of status codes. If I not ready, not found is 14. The item was not found. Okay, 14. If I not found. Code error 14, we'll do that here. So we'll do that, just encode 14, add it as another thing in the list. There we go, too many arguments, expected to have three. Oh, string copy, I don't need to put the uh, size. That would be mem copy, but I can do that. That's true, I don't need the size for that. Okay, and clear screen needs C out. Pointer to this, which is itself. Okay, temp size set but not used. Um, yeah, because I'm not using it there anymore. We'll see if that works without temp size. All right, global variables. And I got a bunch. Although the first line did not print, so or it skipped printing it. Press any key, and then go back, error flag. So it printed a little bit and then skipped it. That's not good, because I print an initial one there. And let's not print that, 
because I would need less than three, not two. Okay, OS indication supported would be the first line. That was skipped last time. So print them all offset too, which is interesting. <laughs> I wonder why it does that. Because I'm just doing S. Why is that even working? Why didn't he give me an error for being stupid and not printing anything here? What is wrong with me? How did that even work? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Why do you... Okay, whatever. I'm printing the variable name buffer. Because that's what I'm passing into getting the next name. It actually is variable name size amount of data. And it should end with a null. But just in case. I'll print in a star here. And do variable name size for that buffer. So see, now I can use my new printing stuff. Hey! Why was it actually printing out? Did it read my mind with like ESP? That was weird. So maybe there was like eight bytes of nulls or something for a size of a pointer. I don't know. But anyway, we get all the variables printing here. We have some platform recovery. We have attempts. For some reason, attempts might be booting attempts or something. Boot current will have the value, a uint 16 of the current boot option, boot load option. We have a boot zero, which means something. Platform language, error out, nvvars, boot 1, 2. So we have at least three boot options, 0, 1, and 2. The order would be the order in which those are tried at, you know, initial power on or reboots. So those print. Um, so that's good. That actually went a little easier than I thought. I don't need temp size. That's good. Less lines of code is better. I don't... I don't like that it printed stuff out, and more so that it printed out the right things without me specifying. That's creepy, but <laughs> that's not great. Probably from how these things are on the stack or something. Anyway, now that I have the global variables printing out, let's have something to... I guess I can load the kernel. I'll have, I'll have these things be other options down here. Because I want to make an option to change the boot variables. So let's say change boot variables, which will print them out and change the values. And then I want other stuff to, um, let's say write to another disk. Write the disk image to another disk to boot from in the future. And then we'll have an install option, which will just write a file to the file system that I can check on boot to say this is installed and skip straight to loading the kernel. So I'll have those as the other two, maybe the only other two options, unless I do like a print EFI, global descriptor table, interrupt descriptor, local TSS, whatever. But that's an optional thing I'm not doing right now. So change boot variables would be the other thing I would want to do in this video. This is probably very long, almost two hour video. It'll be probably three hours. Oh well. And we'll do that. Okay. So change the boot variables. Um, go back to where I was. <laughs> Grab that stuff first. And put it here. So print boot variable values and allow user to change them. Okay. At least for boot order and boot, uh, boot next. Boot current doesn't need to be changed, but boot next and boot order could be changed to set the next boot, very next boot, boot option, one time only, and just the order in which other ones are booted from. So that would be okay. I also should have a way to abstract this sort of function prologue and epilogue that I put everywhere to save lines of code, but I didn't think about that until right now, because <laughs> I'm doing this stuff every time. Whatever. That's fine. So I could have a thing to print the boot variables, which would be like what I'm doing here. It would be kind of duplicated code, just filtering on boot variables. Or I could have it be an abstracted function to call in multiple places. I don't know. Right now, this would probably just be calling everything I'm doing here. So it's duplicated, but we need to go through everything for only the boot variables. So, oh well, I can think about a better way of doing it later. Right now, it's going to be duplicated work. Just keep that in mind. Uh, but easy enough to go through. So after we print them all out, I only want to print the boot ones. Which would be where I'm printing here. 
So we'll say if, and then compare the buffer, the variable name buffer compared to, should be char, char 16, compared to um, boot, the first four characters. If it starts with those, then it is a, a sort of boot variable. So I'll just print those out. And I'll see how that goes. We'll have to use get variable for more info for these. But we can just print the names out right now. But I would want to print the values out as well. And their value. But right now, let's start with that. We'll have a to-do, and then after printing them, say allow user to change values. Change boot order, and we'll say boot next. I'll say those are the only two, because boot current will change when you boot, so there's no point in trying to change that. And other ones I don't think would matter, but boot order would change the order in which they boot. I guess you could delete by using set variable and setting things to like zero bytes in length or null or something. I think you can delete variables that way. But we'll just say we change boot order next. Um, but I'll see if that works for the boot variables here. So change boot variables is the name of that function. Um, and it prints everything out, which is not what I wanted, because mem compare returns zero if they match, not not zero. That would have printed everything except the boot variables. There we go. So we have option support, current, zero, one, two, and order. Okay. So the the values, the values for those variables would be gotten from get variable. We'd have data for these. So let me put that back. I have another window open. I don't. So. Okay, so this is before get next variable name. It would be get variable, returning the value of a variable. Guess I didn't want to do that. Let's just delete that. Okay, so we have the name of a variable. We want to get the the info for the GUID for that variable attributes for it. If not null, we return an attribute bit mask. Okay, just to get values for that, if you want them or not, to, to check. We have the size of the data contained for that variable, and we have optional data, which is included in the size, but it returns contents. Okay. Why is it optional? Maybe null to determine the size needed if you pass a zero. Okay, so we can do that. And then we'll have attributes. I do like that they changed the text for this errata version. I would like them to use this, you know, to font and everything going forward for everything, not just errata versions, because it's easier to read and it looks like they fixed typos other than this. Well, that's defining this comment, but still, whatever. Whatever, man. Mnemonic HR elsewhere, okay. Reserved. What do you mean by reserved? Does this define reserved? Oh, it has a value of 10. Oh, well you missed the define there, dude. You missed a typo there. I guess. Well, they didn't want to define it as, it probably should be a comment, and they didn't want to define it because other things could be defined with that number. I don't know. I don't know what the point of the reserve being there is. I guess it just says don't use that bit number because it's not available. Which is fair. So 
So we'll have runtime access, boot services. So if you're making a new boot option variable, a new load option boot, you know, for hexadecimal value variable, you would want to set these as the attribute bits when you call set variable. You'd want to set it as non-volatile boot service and runtime access. Other ones, if you want, I guess. And I'm not worried about the other values there. At set variable, we will need to actually set like the boot order next variable. So I will take that as well and put it after get next variable name. Okay, set variable is similar. It'll take in name, GUID, attributes, data, size, and data. You're just setting that value instead of getting that value. And let me add these to my runtime services table here. So that they're properly defined. Okay, so what is the data for the boot variables specifically? What is the data for that? That is in the boot mechanisms, or what is it? Policy manager, firmware boot manager. Yeah, <laughs> firmware boot manager, load option processing, load options. Uh, if we look under wherever I was before, 3.3, globally defined variables, this is defined earlier in the spec, but just for, for example, these are called load options, a boot load option. So specifically the boot variables are load options. And the load options have a structure like this. There's a variable amount of data in these arrays. So that's why they're commented out in this definition, but just to show that it's this size and it's here. Variable amount of data. You're given attributes, you're given a length of a file path a list of file path, uh, device path nodes, essentially. And you're given a description, which is a human readable name, a string, ends with a null, which is good. You're given a list or an array of device path nodes, which describe where this load option is, essentially. And you're given optional data after that. So you have to uh, find these things out at runtime and move past them and make sure you use the uh, the length and the optional data. How do it says like how big it is, right? The number of bytes can be computed by subtracting the starting offset of this field from the total size of the load option. Okay, yeah. So the load option struct with this data inside of it would be the data size and data defined within get and set variable. So these two things here. So you get you know an array of bytes essentially, and then what where those bytes are at this data pointer. So the data size describes the size of the data and the data for a boot hash, 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 you know, variable. That is going to be a load option. So the data is going to be this and the data size describes how big this is. So we'd move past and get the length at runtime of this string because C doesn't pass strings with length. And then right after that, we'd have the, the how long this is according to file path list length. And then if we add in that length and this length, at this point, we would get to the optional data. And we can compute all those values from the initial data size from get variable. And this data points to, for the boot options, this structure with this, you know, these contents. So that's what we'll be using. Print out the description. We can also print out device path if we want. I don't think I have that defined. I do not, yeah, I do not have device path protocol defined. I can define that as well, but I want to get at least the load options. So let me put that next to, I guess, get variable. This is in like section three, so it's pretty far up the spec, but whatever. I'll put it ahead of get variable for now. I didn't specify set variable either, I don't think. This is 
And this is, yeah, this is in 313. We'll just copy that. Put it there. This is in 313. Okay. Let's we'll say this is the data layout for a boot variable, if not other types. So we need to get the variable value with runtime services get variable. Which is gonna be the variable name, buffer, the GUID as a pointer, which I called it vendor GUID. Attributes, uh, this would return the attributes. We can get it if we want. The data size, we can pass in a zero. And it will return the size that we need. So I'll just pass that in as a zero, because I don't know. It could be, it's a variable amount of data for each one, so I don't know. But we could pass it an initial buffer of like 1024 or something. That's fine, and it'll pass back the data. Does it say anything about freeing the memory for that? Or get variable, it might. Buffer to return the contents. Actually, it gives me the size, so I have to allocate it, most likely. Yeah, that sounds about right. Mm. Okay. So I'll call it once, it should give me the amount. Call first with zero data size to get actual amount needed. And then we'll allocate some more stuff. will be the actual data, it'll be data size, which will need to be a pointer. Data will be the actual thing. So data data is a void pointer, right? Not a double pointer, no. Okay. And it'll be null in this case anyway. Maybe null with the zero data size to determine the size buffer needed. Yes, okay. And we'll pass that in there. Could not allocate. That's the memory for get variable. And this I'll say maybe go to cleanup because it'll be nested and I need to clean this stuff up. Okay, otherwise we have data for the variable. Well, we have enough we have enough size for it, so I allocated that, so we'll call this. Since I allocate one every time. I mean, I could reallocate if it's too small, or I could free it at the end, I guess, after we print the data. Okay. So we get, a size, we get a call for the size of data we need. We allocate a buffer for that. I fill the buffer with get variable here by passing that pointer with the correct size that we got. It shouldn't be too small because we got the correct size by passing zero first. 
Okay, so now we have to grab the data from there with the if I load option. I'll say that's a pointer, and that'll be a load option pointer to data, because that's what it's going to be. I could make that packed, but the spec didn't have it as packed, so. Uh, okay. So we have attributes, a list, we have description, which will be after these two. So this would be load option plus one, essentially. Right, because that'll add one pointer arithmetic of the size of itself from the start of data. Or I could add data plus the size of load option. That would give the same thing here. Okay, and that'll give the description. Then I can print that out. So I printed... Probably keep these things here too, just to remember them. Uh, so what did I print out? I print out the name, which would be boot something. So the description I could put underneath. Except we had already with that. Okay. Right now I'll just say this description. Description should be null terminated. So I can see how that looks. We'll go down, it'll print boots. Um, I might want two new lines in between. Separate it out a little bit. Okay, boot option support. Description is zero. Boot current is zero. Boot zero is I app, whatever that means, internal application. <laughs> Boot option one is the QEMU hard disk. Okay, my disk image, essentially, QM1. Boot option two is FI internal shell, which should be EFI, not just FI. So I'm probably just one byte off here. Which is interesting, or two bytes off, rather. Which would be from padding, right? So if I'm given a load option, I guess I can't do this because of padding, so I would have to add stuff and not do that. So this is four bytes and this is two bytes. I would have to add six, six bytes. So I can do that. Let's just do this. <laughs> this is a little bit easier. Or I can do size of, you know, you went 32 plus size. Of. This would be the ultimate in portability, right? Even though it's just four dot four plus two. I'll see if that gives a different value. It should just be adding six bytes, but... Okay, well that actually gives the, the first character there. UI app, I guess if it's zero, then there's nothing to show. Well, boot current would have a, a uint 16, so that wouldn't be a valid value. Or there's just nothing to show. Yeah, so the boot with the four hexadecimal numbers have actual descriptions. The other ones don't because they're just uint16 values, I guess, or option support might be a uint32. So I would have to check that. Okay. I get an issue here. Unused variable. Yeah. That's fine. So how do I print the other things here? I can do that. Let's say if not mem compare var name buff compared to say boot order or boot one or whatever. Well, that would depend. So I'd want to print these if they had four numbers here. So let's try that. Let's do var name buff plus four. Although this is what a char sixteen. That's fine. Let's be zero, one, two, three, four. So I can say if is digit. Well, it'd be it could be a hex digit as well, really. Uh, 
digit. Do I have his, his hex or something? I don't know what the word would be in C. Is hex digit? They have, they have one specifically for that. There's is X digit. Would that be it? Is X digit, I guess. Yeah, checks for hex, hexadecimal. Okay. I'll add that in here. Is X digit. If C or greater than or equal to A. And let's say or equal to F, or greater than equal to A, center equal to F. Okay, it's X digit. Easy enough to write. So let's say if X digit four, then it would be boot option. Otherwise, it won't print that out. We could check if it's boot order. Which is 9. 9 times 2 is 18, because each one is going to be 2 bytes for char 16. So if we have the boot order variable, I'd want to just print the number, probably. We'll print description and hash x. At the very least, it would be four, so we'll print dot four. For four digits minimum. And this would be, I guess, the data. It would be wherever the data is. I guess that would be the description, wouldn't it? I feel like that would be right. I might be wrong, though. I guess we'll find out. Undeclared function, because I had it as C16. Uh, boot option support, boot current is a bad description. Boot order description, that's not correct, but that's all right. I feel like that is not, not what I'm looking for. Yeah, optional data starts at this offset, size of, plus size of, plus the string size description, plus the file path list length. Uh, okay. The ordered option boot list. An array of uint 16s, the first element is the value, second element, single uint 16. Is that in the description though, or is it in optional data, or what? Or is the data within hex, or, um, or hex characters and not like this? Could be it. If I do 4.4, .4, is that going to change anything? Probably won't change anything. So I feel like the description should be like 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 2, 1, or whatever. That might be what's messing it up. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Change boot. Don't get any description for a string. What if I try to print it as? Well, it's not going to be char eight, so that's going to be bad. No, 
Okay. I guess I need the description instead of just printing the data. That would probably be better. That's probably why it's messing up. Because I'm getting tired. Let's try that. No, that gives the same thing. Hmm. Oh, okay. S. Because I'm printing data. God damn. <laughs> I am getting tired, sorry. Uh, let's set this up first. Okay. <laughs> and then see if that's going to be a uint 8 or not. That doesn't look like it. Okay, what if I print an S for both? What are you, boot order? You just say it's a zero. I, I know those are not correct, so I need to see what I did in the past to get the right value for that, so I'll be back in a second. Okay, so my, my issue here, I am recording right, yeah. <laughs> My issue here is that I'm trying to take from the description and I'm doing this thing all wrong because I'm dumb. The only things that are load options are these boot number variables. Those are load options. The other ones like boot order are not load options and the spec does say what they are. I just can't read and comprehend things sometimes. So boot order has an array of uint 16s. That's what its data contains in this case. Boot next and current are single uint 16 t values. Option support is a uint 32. Okay. So for these load options, they're load options. They have the load option struct of data, right? It will have a description. These ones like boot order do not. This is an array of uint 16 t values. And the other ones like boot next and current are different themselves. So I'll do stuff for that. Uh, didn't want to do that, but boot order is an array, boot next and current. So I'll just put a, an or here. Do, 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 do. Uh, that's 11, so it'd be 22. Just be a single uint 16 t value. Okay, since this is an array, let's have uint 16 t will have a pointer, p or whatever, to the data. So the data gotten from get variable is not a load option unless it is a load option, which will have a description, human readable name. If it's not, then the data will point to the data. In this case, the data for boot order will be an array of uint 16 ts. So I can print out, not for description, but I'll, I can do like value or whatever. Uh, yeah, so this would be an array of values. So uint 16 t, let's say, is going to be x. And we can print out 0.4 x's at a time. And just print that out from p, well, from the data at p, and then add it. So we can print the first 16 bits and the second 16 bits, which is four hex digits. And the third and fourth, and so on. So I can actually do this first and print the zero X and then do like a fancy thing here, which is not going to be fancy, but oh well. So we can have data size. Yeah. Data size over two is going to be ultimately the size of this thing. That's how much, how much data we're printing for the boot order. So if there's three uint 16 T values, that'd be three by two bytes, right? Which would be six. So, but there would be three values. So this much in total. Now, if I subtract one by doing a zero X first, which actually I don't need to do that. I can just do data size over two and just print a zero X manually. And that's fine. Okay. And then the array values. Yeah. Cause there's two bytes each for 16 T values. There we go. And then th that would print out every uint 16 in that thing. So let's do this for now. And look at what that is. All right. So boot current, I'm not printing anything, of course. So boot order, 0x value. Yeah, I need to change that. But it prints out 0, 1, and 2, which is what I was looking for. So it prints out 
the internal application first, which may be, well, it's not the EFI shell. Maybe it's some OVMF specific thing or QEMU specific thing. But after that, it prints the, the first boot order value, one, which is the hard disk, which is what loads this EFI application. And if we changed or added a boot next normally to uh, set the EFI eternal shell set and set it as two first instead of zero, it should load the shell. Or we can set the boot order variable and put a two first to load the shell. But it's doing that because I have this. I don't want to do that. Let's say when we print a name, this has a new line after it. How would this look? Um, I mean, it does go down by default, so I don't need value. I'll just print that. There we go. Okay, so boot order has zero and then one and then two. That makes sense. I could print out a, a comma to make more sense too. CSV that sucker. Yeah, so that looks a little bit better. Of course, we have a trailing comma, but whatever. That's fine. <laughs> I don't care that much about it. All right. So boot next and current will be a singular UNT16V, UNT16T, effectively, value. And then I'll just print a single value there. So I can print hash, alternate form to have the 0x and an x and four digits at most. And that'll be P in this case for the data. So next and current. We don't have next in OVMF, but at least in my version right here. Um, on hardware, I should have a next. Well, I won't by default, actually, probably, unless something went wrong. We can add a boot next variable if we add a new one. And then on the next boot, it would use that as the initial boot thing. If it works, it works. If not, it'll go to the boot order list. But if it does work, it'll set that, and then the firmware will remove this boot next variable after it boots successfully. Or maybe if it doesn't as well. But that's what the spec says, so... If we have either of those, I'll just print out the singular value. So the current one would be what we're currently booted under. And it actually does not give me that. Gives me a bunch of uh, crap there. Description. Which is nice. So maybe these aren't correct. I guess I might need a new line after all of these. My boot current, okay. That's what this is. Why is it not going here? <laughs> it's not boot order. Oh, because I'm doing A to F, and the C is A to F. Is that why? That's why it's printing this? That's kind of lame, but all right. Let's go to, let's do this. I'll go to next. I have a label there. Or I'll do else ifs or something, because I need to have it before this point. Not a great way of doing this. Um, or I could do continue and it'll go up. I could do a do while. I'm trying to think of the best way to handle this. I mean, it says zero. That should work there. So let's do, I'll try that. While status is not if I not found, we'll do a do while. Well, but then I'd have to check it, wouldn't I? No, never mind. <laughs> I'll do this. I could write this loop to be better. But that's fine. So I want to move these things before this. because this was taking precedence there for boot current because a capital C is between capital A through F for this is X digit function. And I don't want that to happen. That would be bad. So we'll just free the thing there. OK. 
Okay, and we'll see how that works. So just print a single uint16 and not do the other nonsense. Okay, so boot current still prints bad data there, but it does print. So boot zero prints all right, order prints all right. Boot current does not print all right for some reason. Like that should print a single 16-bit value. I mean, I could do H for a short. <laughs> DF18. It's still not correct. I wonder why that's happening. Oh, because I'm printing P. Sorry, God. I need the data at P. Duh. I don't think. I need to dereference it. That would make more sense if I dereferenced it. There we go. Boot current is 0001 because, yeah, I'm booting from the QEMU hard disk. Yeah, that makes sense. Ah, okay, we'll print another new line just so it doesn't run into the, uh, the boot options in this case. So boot option support is a 32-bit value. That may be like a bit mask or something. This doesn't say what that is, does it? It says a single UN32 defines the type supported by the boot manager. So boot option support. Okay, so that is what these things are. I'll take those, I guess, and I'll put them after load option. I'll say boot option support values. Well, I'll say bit masks. Okay. Put this here. So this is 17 multiplied by 2 is 34. And it'll be a 32 bit value. So I'll grab 32. So we'll just print eight digits. No, is that right? Four digits, right? No, you want 16T would be two. Oh, four hex digits, yeah, eight. Eight hex digits, because I'm dumb. That would be, yeah, 32 bit, because each nibble is four bits. I need to just go up. Okay, so 313. And there might be other, other variables and other values on, on hardware. This is just the description, it's not the file path. I could print that out as well. But that would be, so I have support count, and then I have support sys prep, and then also key and app. So all of these are supported, all these ORD together is 313, so that's cool. All those bits in there supported. So let's say we also print out the file path list and maybe the optional data. which on hardware might run off the screen, but that's all right. And then changing the values I might do on the next video because this one's going to be like three hours long. It depends. We'll see. So we have the description. I need to get the length of that. Let's say length. Because I don't have... String length, no, okay. That's fine. So we'll say while B plus plus, string length plus plus, or this 
Uh, which is probably all right. And then we'll have to add one more because there's a no bite and after the no bite. That will get us to this file path list and the optional data. So we need device path protocol. I'll just put a pointer there, file path list. But that will be equal to data, which is if we do a UNAT pointer data plus. I mean, this is where description starts, but still data plus size of UN32 plus size of UN16. Plus the string length here, the ultimate length of it, which is adding with the null byte. Okay. We'll get a pointer to that. That is where the, I think that's where the file path list is. I might be one off. Actually, this would be two because each char 16 T is two bytes. So actually I need to multiply this by two. So I can either multiply this by two or just add two every time. Okay, because singular bytes with the UN date pointer. So I need to add the right amount of bytes here. I don't think I have file path protocol though, or device path protocol. No, I do not. Okay, so that is in the spec under 10 device path protocol, which is just a node for device paths, which is a UEFI way of doing, I'll grab this as well, a UEFI way of uh, separating things out from ACPI with their namespaces that doesn't want to overreach. So it has its own definition of device paths to find where devices are and how they're configured and, and located. So, well, not configured, but located within your, your hardware and your system. So I'll stick this after the eights here, I guess, right here. I have device path protocol. This is section 10.3 or 10.2, device path protocol. Just move this over. Okay. I'll grab the EFI thing there, that's fine. Put it after there. And I'll grab this. So it is a protocol, but it's also just a, a pointer or an array of these struct values. So it is just itself a struct, but it's also a protocol. Protocols are structs anyway, but uh, each device path node of which this is one of them has a type, a subtype, and a length which includes the first two bytes, well, includes the first four bytes of type, subtype, and length. But after these four bytes, you'll have the data for device path node, which it describes here different types, like a, a hard drive would be under a media device path, for example. But the nodes have different values for the first byte for type, byte for subtype, a length of the whole thing, and then the specific data after that length. So very, very abstract, generic nodes. The, the end of a device path is defined by its own specific node type with a, a byte for type of 7f and a subtype ff. And then the, the total length should be four. Then you have different types and subtypes for different hardware device paths and other things. So if I look for say, uh, device path nodes, media device path, say a hard drive, for example, would have type four, that by, the type bytes would be four. The subtype would be one for hard drive. The length would be 42. And you could read out the partition number and stuff. So this should also be created for things that have a partition info protocol attached to them. Things that have a block IO, disk IO protocol, the handles attached to those. Those should have 
device path protocols that have this info as a node in the path, which also says, you know, it's a hard drive with this partition and the signature and all. So this is another way of getting device info, in this case, a hard drive partition. So device paths are pretty nice. You can just iterate over them, checking on the length and the types and subtypes you want to deal with. You can look at the ones you don't want to deal with or don't know about. You can just skip over by reading the length because it's just an array of these structs of these nodes. So it's pretty, pretty cool like that. Pretty nice to work with, I think. Um, but there's other protocols within here for printing device paths, which is what I want to look at, such as the utilities protocol or the display device path to text protocol. That's what I want to look at. I need the GUID for that probably. Which I'll just put, put under the device path. Device path to text. Grab that, and this is section 10.6.2. And this is just a firmware, sort of hardware built-in way to print device paths, so you don't have to parse it and print things out specifically. You can just pass them to this protocol for a, a given node or a full path. Well, the portion of a path to the end of a path with that given end node. <laughs> And it'll tell it'll print it out in a, a human readable form, so you don't have to parse that out yourself. That's kind of that's kind of nice. I like that it provides this stuff. That's pretty cool. Ten dot six dot two. So node to text and path to text. is if I device path to text node, which is 10.6.3. So we give it a node, we tell it display only. The shorter representation is used. If it's false, it has a longer representation. And shortcuts takes a shortcut form where applicable. If you don't need all the info, I guess. Allow shortcuts is false. Parsable or display only. I'll probably just display everything just for more info's sake, but you could, you know, pass in true or false to these if you want. Device path to text has the exact same signature, which makes sense because the path is just a, an array of nodes. We're just given a path instead, which is a node followed by one or more of which it has to end with that end path node. I think that would be the only difference here, but you could also just pass a node, you could pass a path to the node function and it would print one node. You know, a node to the path might not necessarily print the whole path if it's not part of one. And that is the same, yeah, okay. So I'm gonna do probably a locate protocol on this. Because we have the device path list. So let me, let me get that. I'll get it up here before I start doing everything. Let's say to print load option device paths, device file paths. Okay, so I'll do locate protocol. And I need a GUID for that. 
let's do device path to text protocol <laughs> dpttp it's probably fine device path text protocol GUID there we go and then I need something for that Need the protocol itself, device path, the text, protocol. Should be a pointer. I can give the address to that. Okay, cannot locate device path to text, protocol. Okay, so we can assume that that works, unless we get an error. So where I'm printing this load option stuff, I'll have the file path list here, which is a device path protocol. So I can print that out by getting, because this returns char 16, we'll have device path, I'll say text. We can pass that into these functions. So we'll have device path to text protocol, offset to get convert, device path the text or a singular node. I'm assuming it's a full path. So we'll say device path and that takes in the path, which is going to be this file path list, which is a pointer display only. We'll say false and allow shortcuts. We'll say false. So print the full thing out, please. And this will actually equal this. And if it's null, then we could not print that out. So ice path text. Could not get device path text for load option S. And we'll say that is the variable name buffer. Optional data, we could print that out, I guess. But I'll see what this looks like first. So we'll say else. We'll have the device path text. I guess I'll say device path. Depending how much, you know, I don't have to print the description, word description, and these, these words. We'll see how this looks. Incompatible pointer to int because I need to pass a status. Okay. It does not print it out, so I have an error. That's good. And it's stuck and frozen. <laughs> of course. So I did not do that correctly, most likely. I might not have calculated this data correctly here. Which is us usually the case. That's why I did string length plus equal two. Maybe I don't need that. I didn't want to do that. Uh, nope, okay. Okay, I'll have to figure out why that is not working. It should be working. Because right after, well, it gives me a file path list length. That's the length of this to get to the optional data, but it should be after the description. So that's what I am doing. What's the length of the description? And it did find a pointer, but it's not printing it out as char 16t data. Okay, well, I'll have to debug this. I'll be back when I figure that out. <laughs> so see you in a second again. Okay, this is going to be maybe a little awkward. I don't know how exactly I'm going to do this, but I had some storms, <laughs> some bad thunderstorms that took out power and stuff for a bit. And I got stuff back up and I recorded almost an hour and uh, didn't realize because the power was out that my audio interface was not on 48 volts for this mic, so it was muted. Uh, thankfully, I am using... Vim or NeoVim, and they have stuff like earlier and later, 
So it's not that I can't, you know, redo everything that I did. It's just that I, I it was about an hour. So I did earlier by an hour and it kind of reset everything. So I can actually go through what I did. Maybe, probably not. I thought I could go through what I did line by line and go from there, but at least this gives me like a reset point that I can kind of go to because I didn't commit the, uh, the changes. So it goes through everything I did before, I guess. Already at old, oldest change. Yeah, okay. So at least I didn't, I mean, I'll have to redo my work, but that's life. Because I had, I had like no idea where I stopped, so I'm glad that it sort of keeps track of that. Um, the only changes I did probably in the EFI.h file was just adding GUID, so I can have EFI global variable GUID so that that is consistent with the other things. I don't think I made, well, I did make changes to uh, the make file, but I guess I can do those before the other ones. So the changes I want to do to, to the make file is when I'm making changes to this EFI OS loader or the kernel or anything, I'm just going to remake. Oh, well, right now I'm remaking the disk image. I don't really need to do that. I just need to re rerun the script. And this will come in handy when I'm changing the boot variable values uh, later on, because I want to reload and not reset everything. So if I remake the target, which is this OS loader, I want to go into the folder and then remake the disk image with the kernel. And I just want to do that if I remake the kernel as well. So this is a lot of repetition. And maybe I can make a target that does this automatically somehow if the kernel stuff is remade. But anyway, I just want to remake it. Only if there's changes to the kernel or the OS loader file. I don't want to remake the file otherwise. So right now it remakes everything, right? But if I do that again, just run make, it just reruns the shell script. It doesn't, you know, remake everything. So that's all I wanted to do there. I, from the earlier and later stuff, I kind of lost all my changes probably in Vim, but anyway. Oh, I can redo this stuff. So, I don't know if this will work, but, because <laughs> I got rid of stuff in my to-do list as well, of course. Because I assumed that it was working. So I do earlier, one hour. Does it bring it back? If I go earlier, two hours? Nope. Okay. That's okay. So let me remember where I left off. Unfortunately, weather doesn't care. I should have, you know, committed changes and stuff, but that's all right. Okay, so I didn't lose that much work. I just have to change printing a little bit and set the boot next and order variables. All right, so I'm going to change these things with only single, single uint 16 values, like boot option support, boot current. I'm just going to print that on the same line, but the load options I'll print on their own lines, just to save a couple of lines on the screen that I don't necessarily need to take up. So where I'm printing the options here, I'm going to add not a new line, but just a colon, and then that can be the value. So the boot order will be, it's an array, and I print this out anyway. Probably can print two lines there. Boot option support can still print two lines, and it'll print its value. Boot next and current will print its value. So this should work the same. Okay, and then I did, oh, I need to explain how I changed the printing there, sorry. I'll do that in a second. Just make sure, yeah, so boot option support will be on its own line, boot currents on its own line. So it doesn't take up two lines anymore, just one. And I think that's reasonable. So I was doing plus equal two for the string length for the description here, but since this is char 16t data, I can just add in, do a regular string length, and add one for each character, and then add one to skip the null byte, and then if I use that as the base that I offset from for the string length, that's going to use pointer arithmetic two bytes each time, and I'll get the exact value that I need, because before it was incorrect. This is going to be correct. Then the device path text actually does print out, and I'm going to change this printing here as well to just print like a null if it isn't there, essentially. That's all I'll do. So device path text, if it exists, we'll say device path text, else I'll print, you know, no, we couldn't find it. You know, that's reasonable. 
Okay. So then I didn't, you know, this now shows up on the screen correct, right, with the device paths. So FV is firmware volume, and FV file is firmware file, essentially. But for the hardware disk, the emulated hard disk, rather, for boot option one here in the middle, we have a PCI root, so the PCI bus, just the start of whatever it is. We have a, a device on that bus and a function for it. And then we go and send something to SATA through a pass-through protocol or something, I don't know, but th that is the actual hard drive on the PCI bus that this hard disk is emulating, you know, our AHCI device, we'll say. And the other ones are just built into OVMF or whatever, they're firmware devices, firmware files, and they just give UUIDs or, <clears throat> or, GUID, val or GUID values there. A boot order is, of course, a set of UN16s, an array, and that all seems okay. Just get rid of the extra line there right now. So what do I want to do from here? Oh, the FV, where those things are defined. Let me tell you where those are defined, because that would help. If I go to device path protocol, and we go to device path, display format, overview, 10.6.1.6, that section is text device node reference, 10.6.1.6. And this gives the set of standard sort of printing things that it says to print for each type of device path node uh, for the device path, the text sort of protocols. And this gives all these. This doesn't explain the firmware ones, but it explains every, everything else like PCIe, PCIe root, and that sort of things, IPv4, all this other stuff. So the firmware ones are in the PI specification. So let me just go over here. So the PI platform initialization specification, the latest one I think is 1.8 for March. If you go to 2-83, so protocols, device path protocol 2-8. This explains the two things that we have, the file media and volume media firmware device paths for the driver execution environment aware stuff. Um, and FV is a firmware volume device node, which gives a GUID. An FV file is a firmware file media device path node with FV file and its GUID. So that's where those come from. They're from the platform initialization specification and not the not ACPI and not UEFI. So that's all. That's why those say FV and FV file. Optional data I can print as well if I want to do that. So I'll get the load option, and the spec says for optional data under load options, the remaining bytes or binary buffer past the loaded image. If it's zero bytes long, we have a null pointer. And you can be computed by getting the starting offset from the total size and bytes of the load option. So optional data, wherever that starts from the start of the load option data, which for a boot, whatever, that's a load option. So we gave data size and data when we pass those to get variable, we get them back. So the total data size, you know, minus wherever this starts within that data is going to be the number of bytes contained with four optional data. So we'll have to skip over file path list length for the file path list. We add that many bytes, add it onto the end of description, plus it's sort of string length and the null bytes. And that'll be, if we skip over description, we'll have the start of the file path list. We use this length. You know, that's the number of bytes in the list, so we can add that, and then we'll get the start, the starting offset of optional data. And then we have wherever this starts compared to the start of the buffer for the load option data, subtract those, that's the number of bytes. And if data size is greater than that number, then we have that many bytes, that difference within, a, within the optional data here. So we can print that out. I don't have context for this. It's going to be highly context dependent. It could mean whatever. You know, you could use it as passing binary data through a non-volatile variable to a kernel that you load if you want to do it that way. You can use get variable from runtime services in your loaded kernel or OS, and you could get the optional data from there if you store it in there. You know, I don't know why you would, but, you know, that's that's an option you can use. But if I want to print that out, we can uh, we can print that out. So let's say... I'll know where optional data is because it'll be a pointer. And it's going to be after the file path list. So let's say we get file path list, convert it to a, a byte wise pointer for arithmetic, for 
pointer arithmetic, and we'll add on the file path list length. Now that I uncommented the load option there. So we can get load option dereferenced to get file path list length. That's the number of bytes for how long the file path list is. So if we go right past that, we should get the starting offset of optional data. That should be all right. And I'll get the size as well. Let's say you went in. So optional data size will be the overall data size, which I got from calling get variable a second time here. <laughs> and I got it within data. And the data void pointer is the start of the buffer, which this load option is for. So that's the total amount of size, and I can subtract the offset from optional data, offset from the start of data. So I have optional data minus, and then that's a void pointer. So we get a pointer to that as the UNAT. That should be okay. So if this is, you know, 20 bytes deep, that'll be 20. And the total data size, if the total data size minus 20 is zero, then we don't have any optional data. But if we have more than that, then the, the remaining data is going to be for that optional data. So if it's greater than zero, I'll print it out here. Just print one, one new line for that, and I'll just print another one at the end to separate things out. Because this is a, that's not a loop, so I don't need to go to next. We'll just go on. Okay. So I'll print out, say, optional data. Then I'll have a, an inner loop here. I'll say J in case I'm using I. I don't think I am, though. No, I can use I here. So let's say we'll just print every single byte, and I'll just print it as, you know, uint 8 bytes. It doesn't have any context. I don't know if it's, you know, a, a readable string or not, or some random number. You went 32, UUID, I don't know what it is. We don't have any indication as to what it is. The specification doesn't really say what the boot load option optional data would be, so it, it could just be whatever. So I'll just print it out as just plain bytes if you need to see it for some reason. We will go with that. And I'll print this as, this be optional data offset by that, offset by i. Um, I can start with the 0x, so it'll be just one full number. Yeah, I'll just print it as a hex value, an 8-bit hex value. And we'll just, uh, we'll go with that. I'll say 0 0.2 just to have leading zeros if need be, because I don't have a zero prefix for um, a flag that I'm handling. So we'll just do that. Just print a bunch of UN8 values for the optional data, which I need to have another new line after that, it looks like. That's okay. So boot two, we don't have any optional data. We just have it for boot one for the hard disk. Okay. That is all right. Let me print an extra new line here for looking better purposes. Okay. Yeah, so the, the internal OVMF stuff doesn't have optional data, but our boot one does. Okay. So then, I think all I did before the power and everything was, yeah, this stuff, we just want to change the, var the variable values. So I'll work on that. So I might make, yeah, I'll make an overall loop here to like reload the screen, or I can make a label that I go to, but... I don't know, people don't like go-tos. I'll just make a loop that we do. I'll say it's an overall screen loop. And we'll put everything in here, including the data pool. Pause at the bottom. Do that. Move all that over. And then this will be for that. Okay. Because I'll change the values, and then after you change the value, optionally we'll reload the screen and load everything back. That's why I'm doing this. So I'll have a, a print thing here. I'll say we can do 1 or B or something to change the boot order. I'll say 1 and 2 is fine. 
Press one to change boot order, two to change boot next, or other key to leave. I'll just say to go back. And I don't think I have a key yet in this function. I do 1557, probably don't in this function. Nope, okay. So we'll say if key dot Unicode character is going to be a one, UN16 value, we'll change the bootloader, else if it's a two, we'll change the boot next value, else it's something else, we'll just break, well, we can go to clean up and clean the buffer, although that's going to be out of scope with this overall loop. because I put it within here. We'll have to do this. We'll put it within there. So if I want to break, I want to just leave. I'll get rid of that, go back in that key. This would leave the overall loop, but I want to free this regardless. So let's do that. Yeah. And then that'll break and return. Okay, else we'll have changed something. I want to free the buffer because I'm going to start again and get the next buffers and stuff. So I want that to be properly scoped there. Okay, so changing boot order and boot next. So let's say set new array of uint 16 t values. And we'll do that. In this, I can use my get functions for getting, you know, an int and a number. Um, one thing I added, yeah, I need to add it back. So what I what I want to do here is if the user enters in like, you know, zero 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 zero, some some number between zero and all f's for uint sixteen. If they press escape, I want to stop early or not take in the number. But I can't do that from within this function that I want to use to get a number for a loop. Say so get hex. I'm going to just leave early and return false if they press escape, similar to this if they passed in a null pointer. So if key.scan code is the scan code for escape, I'm just going to return false. User wants to leave. I'll just say else, you know, we'll get the next character for numbers and stuff. So I'll just add that in when I'm getting a number. If they put escape, then return false. Okay, so I need an array of uint 16 t values. So let's say option array. Let's say we have a maximum number of values. Max boot options, we'll say. That makes sense. I'll just have it be 10. Maybe you don't need to load more than 10 in your menu. I don't know. <laughs> 10's a good, good even number. I have I not scoped here. Yeah, I can use I and that'd be all right. So we'll add up to 10 values here. And then I'll get a number. Or I'll get the next number. Let's say we'll print printed this, but what I'm going to do is print a new line here because I'm going to do multiple. I'm going to do one per line. So we'll say boot option percent %u and I'll print the i for that. And I want to limit it to up to four f's. And then we'll print what the user is doing by calling that get hex, get hex function. So I'll print i for that. I'll get hex if they press escape or something and it won't work, but I'll just do this. We need a new option to set. I'll have new option. If they don't do it, we'll leave. I'll probably just go to go to clean up here. Stop processing. Or we can leave and go to done. 
I can have a label here to like break. I can do that. Yeah, I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll do that, I guess. But if they did enter in an option, then we have it. I want to add it to the array. Um, let's say num options. So I'll add it to the option array. We'll have num options plus plus, and that'll equal our new option. And then we'll go up by one, add it to the next one, go up by one, add it to the next one. I'll set this as probably plus one. So it'll say boot option one, two, three, instead of zero, one, two. It makes a little bit more sense in this case. If they stop, press escape or whatever, we'll go, and then we'll add it to the array, whatever we have. We'll add the options array as the new boot order variable, which means I need to use set variable, not set virtual address map. And it has the same parameters as get variable, pretty much. So I'll just grab that. So the name that I'm going to set here is going to be just boot order. The GUID, let's have GUID. We can just say if I global variable. That's what it'll be. Attributes will be the same attributes as we had before for boot order, which I'm not saving. So I'm going to add a variable for that outside this loop. I believe attributes is event 32 So I'm going to call it boot order attributes. And then when I get boot order here, I'm going to set that. because it would have been set from this get variable here. This will be used if the user sets a new boot order value. And I'm just say, yeah, I'll just get that. I'll print the array else wise. Okay, so if we have that, we can pass that into here. Boot order attributes, so the size for the data, for this boot order value, since it's just an array of UN 16s, it'll be the size of the array for however many options um, were input. So that'd be this num options is why I added that. So if it adds, if we add at least one, we want to multiply that by two because two bytes for UN 16 T value. If we add two, it'll be four bytes, so on and so forth. So I can add in num options times two. And then the data is going to be the array itself, the option array which is a pointer. Uh, let me check whether these are pointers or not, because I don't remember, to be honest. <laughs> I should, but I don't. Didn't want to do that. Let's go to set variable. So pointer, pointer, not, not, and a pointer. Okay, so the first two are pointers, and then the next two are not. So attributes is just a plain value, num options, plain value. The option array is a pointer for the data to take this amount of data from given these attributes for this GUID to set and this variable. Okay. And we'll say if EFI error status, we'll print an error message here. Could not set new value for boot order. Okay, just to let the user know if something went wrong. And then we'll go, we'll free the pool, we'll print everything out again. Let me, let me clear the screen in that case. I'll do it here initially. So we'll clear everything out, print everything again, and the boot order should be changed from that point on. So for boot next, um, OVMF doesn't have this value and it doesn't really work for QEMU for me, but on hardware it may work. So I'll just put it here for, for learning purposes. Boot next will contain the, the number for the boot option to run on the very next boot. So if you set a new boot next variable to, you know, the EFI shell, for example, on the next boot, it'll boot the EFI shell and the firmware will, the firmware will remove the boot next variable. And you can set it again if you want in the future. So it's for like, 
if you want to test things out, it can make things easier just to set one boot option as a one-time thing. That's what boot next is for. Boot current contains the value of what was booted, but you can't set it. Well, you can set it, but there's no point because it'll be set on the next boot anyway. But if you do use boot next, then boot current should be set to that value on the next boot. And the boot next variable will be removed if it was booted successfully. Other than that, setting the boot order will change the order and you can just set the first value to be something else, you know, to boot that on the next boot. So a few different mechanisms to do things, but that's all right. So I'll say if we get a value here, let's just do this. Um, I'll say boot next value. And then we'll get the hex value that you enter in. And if we got the value, then we'll use set variable. If we got it, we'll do set variable for boot next. We'll set the GUID. The attributes I'll have just adder. The attributes will be variable non-volatile to be in, you know, NVVARS compliant, non-volatile memory, <laughs> you know, compliant there. I'll set as boot service access to access from boot services. Um, to be able to look at it and, and access it from like get next variable name, it'll be returned and get variable will, re will return it. And we'll set it for runtime access so you can access it after exiting boot services. So this is what all the boot variables should have really, if not other things. But you'll want those three at a minimum to access them everywhere and have it be non-volatile so it'll persist between the next boot. And we'll have that be our attributes. The size of the data is a single UNT16T value, so it'll be two. And the value will be whatever our option is going to be. Get hex new option, let's just set it as value. It's fine. And I'll just put this here if we got an error. Could not set new value for boot next. Okay, so we should be able to set a new array. Should be able to set an array for boot order and set boot next to a single number. Let's see if that works. <laughs> of course it doesn't. Because uh, I messed things up. Incompatible pointer types, you went 16T to you went N, okay. You went 16T, let's make that you went in to match up with the types for value as well when I'm calling get hex. Error did not work because I have to set an initial thing, set the status, because I changed that to take in the status initially, okay. And values incompatible, passing you went in to void pointer here, that's true. Pass in a pointer to value, so it takes the two bytes here. Okay, that works. So let's see what we get. Two to change boot next, other key to go back. Looks like the dots went off. Let me change that then. Just want to change boot order. Or other... Uh, or other to go back. I'll just say, do we only get 80 characters to work with? Okay, so let's change boot order. Right now it is zero, one, and two, as you can see at the bottom. So let's change it to be, two is the EFI shell. So we'll change it to be two, one, zero. And then I'll press escape to leave. It reloads the screen. We see it's two, one, zero. So boot next is not gonna affect anything. So I'm gonna go back. And since I don't remake the disk image every time now. When it loads, it should load that first thing in the boot order array, which is option two, which is the EFI shell. So it won't load the menu or anything. It won't load my boot x64 EFI from the boot, from the disk image. It'll load the EFI shell because that is what I set to load first in the boot order. If I wanted to go back, of course, I'd have to go back to 
EFI boot and go through here and, and then run that, right? We can run that. There's other stuff in the EFI shell we can do. This will probably load. Okay, it doesn't load because I didn't mess with it. That's good. Um, there's other stuff in here we can do. I know I can look at those variables. I don't remember how. <laughs> boot and driver options. BCFG. Boot configure probably. Oh. Let's do dash H. No. Help BCFG. The display driver options. So you can mess with things through the shell as well. Boot dump. So that'll load all the boot variables like I'm doing currently in my... EFI application, but this is, you know, stuff like that. Optional, it says yes. <laughs> I guess if it has data, it just says optional. That's interesting. But you could use um, BCFG from the EFI shell to set these things as well. I'm not going to, but you can. So we can print these things. I could set boot next. I'll show that. So boot next, let's set it to two. And then since it added that as a new variable, it loaded the screen and then loaded that. So boot next should load the EFI shell, but OVMF doesn't do that for some reason and it doesn't do anything. On hardware it might, I'm not sure. But for me, that does nothing. <laughs> it just adds a variable with this name. Um, but I'll have to mess with that on hardware and see if it actually works. Okay, so the only other things I wanted to do was write disk image and do an install thing, which is where I got to in my to-do list. Um, I had, you know, other things that I erased, but I couldn't get them back because Vim doesn't do that for some reason here. Oh, that worked. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why it worked now. Anyway, all right, sometimes er I, the earlier and later stuff is weird to me for some reason, whatever. Um, so yeah, this is what I was doing, redoing. Added main menu to print the variables. I'm doing that. I'm calling, yep, everything that starts with boot. I'm printing with get variable. Changing the boot order, I just added that in. And boot next. Okay, so all I have left to do that I'm gonna do on the next one, gotta have the cliffhangers because I don't want this to go on for six hours. Probably have to break it up anyway. It's probably three to four hours right now. But anyway, I'm going to add a menu option to write to another disk, another drive, which I'll just have. I'll, pr I'll print the block IO info, just probably the size and the media ID for each full disk that is found. So logical partition false and the block info and the block IO protocol media information. If it's partition zero or the logical partition is false, I'm going to print those. So I'm not gonna have you choose a partition, I'm just gonna have you choose a, a drive. And I'm gonna write with read and write blocks. I'm gonna write the disk image from whatever media it's loaded on, read that to a buffer, and write from that buffer to the chosen media ID disk that you choose, right? So I'll just have you choose like zero through nine for the media IDs or whatnot, or call like get int to get a number and choose that. We'll write the disk image to there, which will be the start of the drive, since I'm using partition zero, or the whole drive. And then you can unplug the USB, you can restart the, the computer, and you should be able to choose that in your BIOS boot menu, that different disk that you wrote this to, and it should boot up, so you won't need the USB from that point. Uh, the only issue is that it doesn't really give a good name. I'll just have to put like the size, and you should know the name, because I don't want to mess with going through uh, AHCI, uh, pass-through protocols, SATA pass-through, or, or SCSI, or um, NVMe, or anything, because there's a lot of stuff you could do there. And there's not really a way to get, like, a manufacturer name for a device without doing that. The device path does not have the name. Other things I don't think have the name. ACPI system, system management may. The SM BIOS configuration table, if you get, read and parse that, you might be able to get hard drive names from that in a better way. So maybe I need to mess with that in the future. But, uh, yeah, I'll just print like block IO partitions with a size and you'll be like, okay, I have a 250 gig disk, it's probably that, <laughs> and you can write to that, which will overwrite the data at the start of your disk, so be careful. After I do all that, you should be able to unplug the USB, reboot, and load that from your BIOS menu, which will set those boot option variables, right, like boot current and boot order. And after that, I'll add a, another option to just write a an empty file that just says like install.dat or whatever, and I'll check for that. 
an EFI main, and if it's not there, I'll load the menu, do the normal stuff we've been doing. But if it is there, I'm just gonna say, okay, this is installed to the current disk that we're running on. I'll just load the kernel. I'll go that go there directly. So the point being, you can write the disk image to another disk with your kernel and everything. You can write a file that says this is installed, and you can boot from the other disk that you wrote it to, so it'll be installed to another disk another drive on your target machine. You won't need the USB. It sort of works as a full bootloader and installer at that point, right? It's not, I don't have a really good, you know, like menu to choose boot options from in the BIOS, you know, that's a better way of doing things, but you know, we have boot order, I guess, <laughs> and choose these things. You can make a better abstraction over the, the boot number variables and boot order and maybe display a little menu with those things and you can pick and choose them around like, a, like normal BIOSes allow you to do. That would be an abstraction and a visual thing over the, the, um, the global variables that we have access to. After all that's done, I'll probably mess with fonts, try to get a font loaded if I can find them and, and work with the uh, HII font protocols. If that all works on hardware and stuff, I'll pass a font to the kernel. I may pass and, and write GDT values and stuff in a boot menu option. I might not do that on camera though. And I'm gonna look at secure boot and things for signing the OS kernel binaries I guess uh, the uh, passing keys back and forth firmware etc etc so I'll look I'll look into that because I'm not sure how that all works and if I can have secure boot enabled and sign a thing with my own keys and stuff and pass it on probably through those global variables for key exchange key and stuff. Maybe that's how that works or it's at least related. I can look at that, but that'll be after fonts and that's an optional thing right now. If there's other things you want me to look at, I'll look into them. Of course, I'm very slow with getting to things, you know, but I'll at least look at and research them. Um, ARM is an option, but the new Snapdragon processors as of mid 2024 don't necessarily fully support UEFI and ACPI, they use they might use device trees or other things. And they're not as easy to work with and do hardware discovery, I don't think. And everything's mostly device specific, whereas x86 is sort of standardized to the point where you write something for one processor, it should reasonably work on another one. That's not true for ARM, it's very device specific usually, even if it supports UEFI. Um, I may not have access to the, the EL1 and 2 levels, I'm not sure, I'd have to look into specific machines. But we'll see in the future. I don't know, for other hardware, Risk Five or something. But that's what I'm planning to do right now. And we can load and look at boot variables. Maybe, hopefully that's exciting. You can change the boot order. So I'm gonna have stuff written to other disks on the next video and we'll go and make this an actual bootloader. Load it from a different machine without this being on a, a USB stick or anything. So thanks for watching, I appreciate it. I'll see you on the next one. Hopefully I don't have to redo videos a lot to where my voice is dying from talking for like four hours straight or five, but anyway. Uh, but anyway, I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. Greatly appreciate it, and cheers.